Welcome to the Truth and Liberty broadcast. We believe we have a mandate to bring godly change to our nation and the world through the seven spheres or mountains of influence. To further this cause, we give away a product every week that will empower you to get involved in changing your life and changing our world. You can register for our weekly giveaway by subscribing at truthandliberty.net. You can also subscribe to our newsletter to receive weekly updates on guests, news, and much more. This is an interactive live cast and we welcome your questions. To ask a question during the live cast, use the comment or chat features. Now get ready to dive into this week's topics with our hosts on location in Colorado, USA. Hello and welcome to our Monday Night Truth and Liberty live cast. I'm Andrew Womack and we've got our chief counsel here, Richard Harris. He's the director of our Truth and Liberty and tonight our guest is Bill Federer. And I tell you, Bill is a real friend and such a blessing. He's actually one of the uh, board members for Truth and Liberty and this guy is a walking encyclopedia. Absolutely. And it is phenomenal what he knows. Yeah. I just can't even imagine how much effort it takes to put all that stuff in his head. But you are gonna really, really, really be blessed tonight. But before we get to Bill, let's go to uh, Richard and he's gonna announce some things that are coming up and also um, how you can get involved and even ask questions. That's right. Well, thank you, Andrew. It's so good to have Bill with us and uh, good to have all of you watching tonight. Um, if you're watching on our website, I want to, um, that's the best place to watch. If you're watching on Facebook, I encourage you to, to jump over to truthandliberty.net and watch there so you have the most reliable experience and you won't get censored there. And as I say every week, speaking of our website, be sure to check out that resources page. You ought to do that every so often, even if you checked it out a month or two ago, we're always adding new resources. Like for example, we have Biblical Citizenship in Modern America, a new course and workbook by Rick Green. That's just one of, one of many things, as well as a copy of the new lawsuit that was filed against the progressive Secretary of State in Colorado, challenging her destruction of election records. You can get all that on our website. Um, coming up here at Andrew Womack Ministries and Karis Bible College, there's some great events coming up. This last weekend was the heart of Christmas. I hope you didn't miss it. Uh, it was a great event. I think DVDs are available for purchase on the website are, for that. You, it was awesome. And if somebody has watched it before, we had to change some things because one of our main characters got quarantined in England. And so we had to reshoot it. And it's the same story, but told by a different person. And it is new. All of the backgrounds are new. It was spectacular. Yeah, that's awesome. awesome. And then coming up this next week is the live nativity here at the campus, uh, December 16th through the 19th. So a great time for family. The Phoenix Gospel Truth Conference is January 6th through the 8th, where Andrew's going to be ministering along with uh, Bishop E.W. Jackson. So if you can make it out to Phoenix, you will not be sorry. That's going to be a great event. And then the Orlando Gospel Truth Conference, February 10th through the 12th. Uh, and so you can find out more information at awmi.net slash events. And then uh, also, if you're not a subscriber to Truth and Liberty, uh, I encourage you to do that. Just go on our website at truthandliberty.net in the upper right hand corner and click subscribe. Give us your email and you'll start receiving our weekly uh, blogs and newsletter. And uh, you'll be eligible to receive a free product, one of Andrew's books. Last week, Tim Klein, congratulations, Tim, you won excellence, how to pursue an excellent spirit. Uh, and this week, it's uh, one of my very favorites of your books, Andrew, is how to find, follow, and fulfill God's will. And I tell you, this is awesome. So chock full of practical wisdom for anybody who's seeking God's will in your life. Uh, become a subscriber today and you'll be eligible for that. Um, Andrew mentioned it's an interactive process. We want to hear from you. We want your comments and questions tonight. If you'd like to send in a question for Bill or Andrew, you can do that in the chat function on our website or the comment section there on Facebook. And also, uh, how to be a member, Truth and Liberty. We're doing what we're doing because of your generosity. And if you're not a member, you look around at what's going on in America and in the world and you want to make a difference. You know, sometimes you feel like you don't have all the answers and everything to do it all on your own, but, but you can join with us, become a member of Truth and Liberty today, and you'll be a part of, of turning America back to, back to God. Just go on the donate page and uh, go where it says become a member or one-time donation. Go to the go to member and sign up to give at least $5 a month 
or more uh, on a recurring basis, automatic donation, and you'll become a Truth and Liberty Coalition member. And we'll send you Alex McFarland's new book, The Assault on America, How to Defend Our Nation Before It's Too Late. And uh, last thing tonight is if you need prayer, you want someone to agree with you in prayer, uh, we've got a 24-7 prayer line now at Andrew Womack Ministries. Thousands of calls every day coming in there and lives being changed. Just call in 719-635-1111. So tonight we've got Bill Federer with us, and like I said, he's on our board of directors here, and Bill's just been a great friend to us. Uh, I've mentioned this every time I've had him on, but I get his American Minute, and I have learned a lot through that. And uh, he puts that out. He'll send it to you. I get it on a daily basis. You've also got a radio program, mm -hmm. and I just found out today that he's got a TV program, and so we're going to be putting him on Gospel Truth TV. I didn't realize you had that. So that's a blessing. But anyway, he's just a historian, really, from a world perspective. Uh, he goes back, uh, and I'm sure he'll do it tonight. He'll go back to Plato or back yeah. thousands of years, and it's just like he's got a perspective that most of us don't have. So welcome to our program, brother. Well, we love you. Andrew, uh, Richard, great to be with you. Yeah, yeah so. that's awesome. So uh, what do we mm. want to talk about? We were talking before the thing started about what was it? The um, well, kind of crisis and antichrist and how all that works. And but you were you were talking about how that you indoctrinate oh mm -hmm. a, a group of people or something and condition them to accept all of this change. So yeah, so it's a, <clears throat> excuse me, a fascinating study on how to brainwash a nation. Okay, that's and what it was. So you uh, go back to the 1800s and marketing was. Uh, Wells Fargo wagon and Sears catalog, and you would list every possible detail about a sewing machine. And then in the early 1900s, you had magazines with slick ads, and they found that people would buy something without knowing what's in it if it looks like everybody's using it and they're happy. And the classic is Crisco. Nobody knew what was in Crisco. And they uh, had these pictures and these magazines of happy moms serving the food to happy families and made it look like everybody's using it. It was so successful, it put out of business the lard industry. Mm. And do you know what's in Crisco? Lard. It's cottonseed oil. Oh, so I thought it the was south, just the same thing. In the South, they would have these um, uh, mountains of cotton seeds that they took out of the cotton and they'd squish it into this black mucky oil and they would use it in machines in factories. Nobody ate that stuff, but somebody had the idea of bleaching it and having a nice ad campaign and we've all eaten it. They even made up a term, it's called vegetable based, right, to hide what, was, what it was. And so people buy something, not because they know it, but because it looks like everybody's using it. And then we go a little further into the 1930s and there's Orson Welles, and he's an actor and he's doing a radio drama called War of the Worlds. We interrupt this program to announce that New Jersey is being invaded by Martians. Mm -hmm. And everybody across the country immediately freaks out, runs outside and looks up in the skies for spaceships. It was a phenomenon that here you can motivate the whole country through fear. And then you get to World War II and you have Joseph Goebbels is the minister of propaganda for the National Socialist Workers' Party, the Nazi. And he would orchestrate these Coliseum events with 100,000 people, and with the fear of the war, they would begin to give the Hitler salute in the front. And they would work its way back, and everybody would see everybody else giving it, and they would feel pressured to give it, and then you'd give it, and then somebody would see you give it, and then they would feel pressured to give it. And it was this manipulating of public opinion of people's desire to want to fit in with the group. And um, it is uh, later, it was called uh, psychological operations. And so Kalvitz was a 19th century military theorist. And he said, the purpose of war is to force your enemy to submit to your will. So you're killing their body. Why? Well, because their mind is loyal to the other side. What if you can just mess with their mind? What if you can just get them to not be patriotic or, or be demoralized or get into fear? And so uh, Sun Tzu's Art of War, 5th century BC, He's given all these strategies, you know, never fight in front of a river because if you're losing, you can't run away, you know. But he said the supreme excellence in a commander is to get your enemy to surrender without a fight. Mm -hmm. And now it's called fifth generation warfare where you get your enemy to surrender without them even being aware that they're in a war. And so it's messing with their mind. And so a whole lot of attention got on this. So you had, um, 
you know, during World War II, we'd have airplanes dropping pamphlets written in German saying, your side is already lost, your commander just hasn't told you yet. And so it, it would demoralize them. And they did the same thing to us with Tokyo Rose, right, in the yeah. Pacific. And she'd have this nice seductive voice talking in, in English, well, you Americans are so terrible. And, you know, and it would just demoralize. And so this phenomenon got studied more and more. And after uh, World War II, it was uh, an experiment called the Solomon Ash Conformity Experiment, and they did it on college campuses. And they would pull eight students into a room. Seven had been paid ahead of time to be actors, and one was a naive participant. And when they uh, put two, the key teacher put two cards on the front desk. One card had one line, and the other three lines one longer, one shorter, one the same. And one by one, the paid actors would stand up and convincingly say that the shorter line was equal to the first line. But by the time it went around to that eighth naive participant, 30% of them would deny their own eyes to fit in with the group. Mm. This power of wanting to fit in. Um, they even did this after the Korean War. So these guys loved America. They went in and they got captured. We rescued them. They hated America. They said, what happened to these guys? Well, it's something called brainwashed, uh, the Buddhist term of cleansing the mind. And so they would put the, the prisoner in isolation and deprivation, and they would emotionally get to the place where they would just crave wanting to just get back to having relationships with people. And they would get to this breaking point. Then they would pull them out and have them in a room with a bunch of guys who had already caved. And before this person would be accepted into their group, he had to confess his whiteness. He had to confess that he was part of the evil Western capitalist system. And when he finally re rejected America, then he was embraced and encouraged and so forth. And so the, the idea is that human beings want to fit in with a group. It's a base human desire. And if you think of it, there, a water molecule is an individual water molecule, but you put it together with other water molecules and it operates as a group, nice waves and clouds. An individual fish is individual. It's in a fish bowl, right? But you put together with other fish, it operates in a group and makes these nice swimming patterns and can change real fast. A bird's in a cage, but if you put it together with other birds, it operates in a group and they can make fly out beautiful patterns. Well, human beings are individuals, but when we're with other people, we, we're operating in a group. We always want to, we're giving and receiving signals. Are we being accepted? Are we being rejected? And we want to be accepted. Little kids, late, ladies read fashion magazines. They want to see what's in because they want to wear what's in. They want to be accepted. Little kids in, in school, they want to wear the same tennis shoes that everybody else does. They want to be accepted. It's a primal human desire. And at the beginning of America, the majority of the people were Christian. And so a non-Christian would adopt Christian behavior so he would be embraced and accepted into the Christian society, even though he had not been born again, he would adopt this Christian. Well, now they have co-opted the public opinion molding groups and they're putting, they got the media, the Hollywood, the education, and they're putting the public pressure to uh, give up Christianity and to embrace their, their new uh, views and so forth. So it's, it's a very powerful uh, phenomenon of group pressure. And, you know, here's, Here's Peter. He tells Jesus, I'll never deny you. A couple hours later, Peter is in a group of strangers around a fire. And a girl gets in his face and says, you're with Jesus. And you can see Peter looking at the people around the fire. And he goes, I never met the guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Boom. Just that easy. The, the power of group. Now, for, for Peter's sake, after the resurrection, he was born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, and he didn't care what the group said. He stood up to the Sanhedrin and he says, we told you not to speak in his name anymore. And he says, we're going to obey God rather than man. Mm -hmm. And so that's the key. The only way to be free from caring about what the group thinks is called the honor shame culture. It's where the most of the world works. Right. And in the Far East, it's, it's not an absolute right or wrong. It's you're accepted in the group. Hey, you're worth something. If you're rejected by the group, your worth goes down. In Islam, they call it the Ummah, the community. And if you're honored by your community, that's great. If, you're shamed, if your daughter embarrasses you in front of your Uma community, they'll murder their own daughter to regain honor. The, the, the power of wanting to be accepted in the group. Well, Jesus calls us out of the group. He says, you do not fear man. 
He, he says once says, you seek the honor of, of men rather than the honor from God. Mm -hmm. It says some of the people believed in Jesus, but they, they didn't want to be pushed out of the synagogue. They didn't want to lose the honor of man. But you have to shun that and say, I do not care what people think. I only care what God thinks. That's when you're free. And I, uh, there's a poster. There's um, um, uh, an Orlando Magic basketball player, um, Isaac, um, forgot his name, but you can look it up. Uh, but he was the only one that stood when they were doing the protest kneeling. And, uh, and kneeling is the, is the universal sign of worship, right? Why did they get so upset when Tim, Tim Tebow kneeled? Because they knew he was kneeling to God. It was a sign of worship. Christ, you know, anyway, and so when he would, when, uh, he would not bow, they asked him afterwards why. And he goes, well, I believe that God, you know, basically loves us all. And the, the God's plan of sal is salvation is for all of us. And that, um, that we're all basically sinners and, and God's Jesus died for all of us. And then there's another, um, uh, uh, Kum Kumrad, he was with the giants, a, ba a baseball player. And he was the only one in the entire baseball field that didn't kneel. And they asked him afterwards, why did you kneel? He goes, oh, I'm a Christian. I only kneel to God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And so these early, early Christians would go to their death before they would kneel before anything other than God. And so, so this idea is that what we're seeing, what we're witnessing today is an intentional manipulation of perceived public opinion to get you to give up your views and just be accepted in the group. Mm -hmm. And it is, um, it's, it's a powerful phenomenon that, um, that they're trying to manipulate. So after, uh, during the Cold War, they um, had our government wanted to uh, basically wake up America to the Soviet threat. And uh, so Al John Foster Dulles was Secretary of State, Alan Dulles was the head of the CIA. And the CIA was feeding stories to the, all the major news networks. Uh, to mold the public opinion regarding foreign policy. And ostensibly, it was for a patriotic purpose because the Soviets were a real threat. And um, Carl Bernstein, who's the Washington Post reporter that did the Watergate uh, breaking, you know, the, the break that story, he was uh, doing a 1977 Rolling Stone article. It's called The CIA and the Press. And he says that the CIA has 400 assets, 400 people that are in all of the major media, and they basically take the CIA story and they send it down through their, their network. Hmm. And, um, and of course, when that became public, the CIA is like, oh, no, no, we, we shut down that program. It's like, okay, yeah, right. Well, you know. <laughs> and um, so, but it's this idea that now it's done online and everybody wants to be liked and followed and friended and nobody wants to be deplatformed, canceled and, you know, blocked. Mm -hmm. And so people will, will change their, their views because they want to be accepted. And, um, there is a, um, what, um, there, there's, there's so much more there. I, I even go back to Plato in, in Athens where, you know, they had Kings all around I the world. I knew you'd get to Plato. Yeah. You here we always are. do. <laughs> By the way, I, I have a book, it's called Socialism, the Real History from Plato to the Present. And, and we just came out with a flash drive that has uh, a dozen presentations of me talking about the book with all my PowerPoint slides. Oh, wow. And um, so anybody That's wants a that, they should, should they contact worth far more than $20. Or, well, give them your website. Uh, well, it's, okay, it's AmericanMinute.com. AmericanMinute.com. Let me also say, uh, I usually minister what you're saying from people fear rejection. God made us for acceptance and so people yes. fear rejection. You're basically emphasizing that we have a desire to be accepted. I mean, is this like uh, two ends of the same thing? Mm -hmm. Acceptance, rejection. So I'm just emphasizing that people fear rejection. You're emphasizing that people want to be a part of a group. It's kind of the same thing. Yeah, they, they, it's called the spiral of silence. I mean, it has different names, but it's exactly what you're talking about. This was an interesting experiment that they did. It was a wine tasting. Everybody was in on it except one couple, and they poured vinegar in the wine. And this couple says, this tastes terrible. They write on their little card, this tastes terrible. Well, everybody else, one by one, stands up and says, this wine tasted great. It was robust. It had character. Got around to this couple. They scratched out what they wrote, and they stood up and said, yeah, it, it, we liked it. Uh. 
Mm -hmm. And then when somebody said all they did was pour vinegar in, the couple that had changed their views criticized the person for saying that they poured vinegar in the wine. And it's a phenomenon called false enforcement, that once people buy into a lie, they will help enforce that other people buy into it. Yes. We see believe that their happening own today. You know, Don't you think that the vaccine and the mask mandate, I mean, this is the same stuff, isn't it? I mean, I've talked to people that are in science and they say that uh, the size of the virus and the holes in the mask, it's like trying to stop mosquitoes with a chain link fence. <laughs> yeah. Basically, they are, they're not effective. But, and even Rand Paul was talking to Fauci and he says, so basically these masks are, are political theater, right? And, um, but once people buy into it, they'll pull out their camera and they'll want to videotape somebody. You're not wearing your mask, right? <laughs> and this is something else. So this false enforcement, Stanley Milgram experiment done in the 1960s at Yale. This is sort of scary. So they, they advertise and they get strangers to come in. Some of them have college degrees, others are just off the street. And they tell them, okay, one year you're gonna be the teacher and the other's the learner. And we're gonna put the learner in another room, but the teacher can still hear him. And the teacher has a sheet of paper with questions. And then in front of him, he has a electric board that will administer a shock to the person in the other room whenever they got the answer wrong. And, um, and now the, the person in the other room was not hooked up to anything electric and he, would, he was playing along with it. But they, the guy would ask the question, he'd get it wrong, he'd give him a shock, a shock. And the guy in the other room would say, ow. And then each time he had to- But he wasn't shocked? He was not shocked. He was just, he was just playing along. Yeah. But then they would, each time he got it wrong, they would turn the intensity up more and more and more. And they found out that these people would uh, say it was wrong. They would go, and the guy would be like, ah, and then they say, I, I, don't, I shouldn't, I don't want to do this anymore. And all they needed was a person in a white coat saying the experiment must continue. And it's like, but, 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 but it's, the experiment must continue. It's like, well, okay. And then he reads another question. The guy gets it wrong. But the guy was all the way up to 450 volts. This guy was pressing the button and the guy in the other room was screaming. And finally the guy got silent. He goes, did, did I kill him? Did I kill him? And he says, the experiment must continue. And he says, from now on, just read the question. If he doesn't answer, consider it wrong. And he's like, minister, these four, 65% of the people would administer the maximum. And they would say, I do not feel good about this. I feel wrong. They will deny their conscience if there is an authority figure mm. like, a, like, a, you know, like a Fauci that, that stands up there and says, you have to do this. Mm. Mm. And it is this studying of how you manipulate a mass of an entire nation. So with COVID, for example, now we're seeing them uh, blame. It's like when President Biden said that this is a, an epidemic of the unvaccinated, you know, and I, I know here in Colorado that Polis has issued an order authorizing hospitals to turn away the unvaccinated. And he said this weekend that it's your own darn fault if you end up in the hospital with COVID. Is that, you know, part of conditioning the public to blame the innocent? Well, it, it is. And, and it's interesting that the Bible talks about these principles of being accepted and rejected and the, the fear of, um, you know, people, you know, here's Zedekiah. He's the last king of Judah. And Jeremiah comes to him and says, look, king, just go out to the king of Babylon and surrender and all of Jerusalem will be spared. And Zedekiah responds, but the Jews that are in captivity may say bad things about me. It's like, really? You're going to let Jerusalem get destroyed. You're going to let your kids get killed. You're going to let all this stuff get, because you care about what the, the Jews that are in captivity are going to say about you. I mean, the, the wimpy excuse, and I'm convinced that a lot of people, when they, you know, the Christians, when we finally, you know, get to heaven and you're going to look back at your life and say, why didn't I stand up for Jesus? And, and, and it says that, you know, we'll see the devil as he is and will say, is this the guy that made the nations tremble like that scrawny little rat in the corner of the rooms like that's Satan. That's the guy that made everybody, you know, but, but it manipulates this desire to, um, to, to fit in and be rejected. But, uh, one of the, um, the other tactics they use, uh, by the way, I wanted to th throw in the, the Plato thing. So, uh, most of world history, the most common form of government's a king. And if you want to push an agenda, you got to get in to see the king. Uh, and so in China, the emperor had 2,000 concubines and Mandarin eunuchs 
And so they would go to the mandarins and say, hey, can you arrange a meeting for me and the emperor? And here's a little money on the side. And, but in Athens, there, there was no emperor, no king. It was the people. It was a democracy. Demos means people, cross means rule. And so if you have an agenda, how do you pitch it to a whole city? Well, that's when the Greeks invented theater. And they would put on plays, comedies, tragedies, satires. And in these plays, they would ridicule and buffoon certain point of view and honor and extol other point of view. And you read the comedies, they, it's like Saturday Night Live. They would name current politicians in that era by name and just rib them to death. And then people would leave the theater saying, man, I don't want to be like that guy that was made fun of. I'm going to sort of shun away from him. And, um, and this other person, man, he, he was noble. He was character, I, you know. And so from that time till now, theater, media is always political in a country where it's the people that make the decisions. And I tell people, think of your favorite movie or sitcom. There's a character that's cute. They're funny. They're the hero. And, and you find yourself identifying with them. And as this series goes on, the character begins to make morally compromising decisions. Little lying here, little cheating here, little lust, little revenge. And you find yourself apologizing for him, saying, saying, I know James Bond is with a woman he's not married to, but he's about to save the world. So can we get on with the story? And it minimizes something that used to be important to you, marital yeah. fidelity. Yeah. And then they portray people with old traditional values as backwards and bumpkins yeah. and simpletons and idiots and even hateful. And the person turns off the TV and says, yeah, that, that, that person, they were really religious and stodgy and that, that was bad. And, and the other person, they're so cool. I, I want to wear their tennis shoes and wear their cologne. And, you know, mm. and so we have to realize that somebody's paying for that show to be on TV. So, and you know who's paying is the, all the commercials. Right. But somebody's paying the, the, the script writers. Somebody's pay, somebody's pushing an agenda, but it's all designed to push. Uh, yeah, it's to, to, to mess with your mind. I was it, just it, watching uh, NCIS. I, did, I didn't watch the whole thing, but I started watching it and they had a religious fanatic that killed people because it was God was telling him to do it. And I could see where this was going. They mm -hmm. were going to ridicule Christians. And man, I just turned the thing off, didn't want to see it. Yeah. But people will like that show and so they'll watch it and like you're saying, violate their own conscience and standards yeah. because they like that show. One of the other tactics they use is called psychological projection. Uh, I may have mentioned this before, but uh, it's where uh, Sigmund Freud a psychologist said that rude people will deny in themselves a negative quality, but attribute that exact quality to someone they don't like. And so little kids do it. I'm not the mean one. You're the mean one. And uh, a wife beater will beat the tar out of his wife and say, well, it's your fault because you provoked me. Or a Sharia man will rape a woman and blame her for it, saying, well, you tempted me. It's your fault. And so it's gotten into politics. And so David Axelrod was the campaign manager for President Obama, and he was on NPR radio. And he said, in Chicago politics, we have a tradition where you throw a brick through your own campaign office window and then call a press conference to accuse your opponent. Mm -hmm. So you do the crime and you blame it on the, your opponent. And so they have to back up and try to show that they were innocent and their name gets repeated. And in, what's in media, it's called guilt by association. So that's why they always tell, I ran for Congress three times. And they would counsel you. If you're accused of something, never repeat the accusation in your denial. Because all they print is they put your name with the accusation. And they just, most people don't read the whole article. They just, they just look at the, the highlighted words. Mm -hmm. And so this, uh, uh, this idea has gotten into politics so much. For example, let's say there's a candidate running for president that's colluding with Russia, giving away a fifth of the U.S. uranium in exchange for a $145 million contribution to her foundation. This would never happen. She <laughs> would want to pay for a steel dossier to accuse her opponent of colluding with Russia. His name gets smeared with it in the media. And if the finger ever gets pointed back at her, by that time, the water's muddied. The public doesn't know who to trust, and she gets a pass. And then the investigation process is an excuse to subpoena all the evidence that could convict her and destroy it. Hard drives, servers, emails, text messages, just smash them all. Let's say there's another candidate running for president that's extorting Ukraine, saying, stop investigating my son or I will hold back billions of U.S. aid. You want to accuse your opponent of extorting Ukraine. Right. And then even have him go through a mock impeachment. You want to accuse him of the exact crime you're guilty of. Man, and that's scary. 
And it's even in, in the Bible. So when <laughs> Apostle Paul was uh, there, I think it was before Festus, and he's he having a trial, and this guy from the Pharisees comes, or Tertullus, whatever his name was, and he's saying, we found this Paul a pestilent fellow, and he is stirring up, and he's causing riots, and he's all this and that. And Paul stands up and says, look, it's only been a couple of weeks since I've been there. You can talk to anybody. I was just going to the temple. I wasn't doing any of that. You were the ones that were stirring up all this rioting, right? But they wanted to blame innocent Paul for the guilt of them stirring it up. <clears throat> Why is this important? Because every day they do it against you. They say you're divisive when they're divisive. They call you hateful when they're hateful. They call you a, a racist when they're racist. They call you, you know, a Conspiracy. bigot and intolerant and everything when they're the ones that are bigoted and intolerant. They want to project their hate on you and what you can keep backing up. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. And they're just gaining ground. The only response is you have to call them out on it. Say, no, you're the hateful one and you're projecting your hate on me. Put them on the defensive. And then, of course, the people that are listening to all this, like, what, what's this psychological projection again? And they can, they can do a little homework themselves. They found out this is a tactic that's used all the time. It's used every single day in the mainstream media that they So what's accused. the defense against it? Well, the defense, first thing is you call it out. You have to name it. You know, like, like in the Bible, if, mm. the, if you're, you're being... Um, you know, until you can name the devil and name the, you know, the spirit, you, you call it out. But you have to name it, and then you got to tell everyone that they're the ones that are guilty of it, and they're trying to project their guilt upon you. Mm. And um, so, so again, this is something that's used every day. So um, uh, Hitler, um, he had a, uh, a party. It's called the National Socialist Workers' Party. And there was a... Uh, a violent group that was connected with, it's called the Brown Shirts. They were nicknamed Sturm Abteilung, which means stormtroopers, because they would storm into the meetings of Hitler's opponents and disrupt the meeting, shout it down. And then these Brown Shirts would lock arms and block access to public buildings. Could you imagine people locking arms and blocking access to buildings? <laughs> no. And then they uh, went into the cities and they smashed the windows and looted and set on fire over 7,000 stores in downtown Berlin and all these cities across Europe. And it was the night of broken glass and they, they were Jewish owned stores and they destroyed them all. But then they uh, had an insurrection against their capital and the burning of the Reichstag. The Reichstag is their capital and evidence points to Hitler's own people setting the fire. But Hitler accused his uh, political opponents of being behind it. And in the confusion, he rounds up all of his political opponents, holds them in jail and then has them shot without a trial. And when the dust settled, Hitler didn't have any political opponents left. Mm. And Germany transitioned from the Republic, the Weimar Republic, to a dictatorship with the Fuhrer. So you do the crime, you accuse your innocent opponents, you use it as an excuse to round them all up and put them in, in January 6th prison and then, you know, get rid of them. Stalin did the same thing. So 1934, uh, Stalin is facing a growing anti-Stalinist movement, sort of like a Tea Party movement, and he didn't like them. And then there was a supporter of Stalin named Sergei Kirov, and Sergei Kirov was the party boss of Leningrad. He was handsome, he was articulate, and he would give these speeches praising Stalin, saying Stalin's the best guy in the whole world. They even built a statue to, to Sergei Kirov. Well, Stalin had an idea. He would assassinate his buddy, Sergei Kirov, and eliminate a potential rival, and he would blame it on the anti-Stalinists. And everybody would believe they did it because the anti-Stalinists didn't like Sergei Kirov and they didn't like Stalin. Stalin used that as an excuse to round up and kill over a million people in the first great purge in 1936. Amazing. This is a tried and true political strategy Mm. that you do the crime, <clears throat> you blame the crime on the innocent people, and you use it as an excuse to round them all up. Well, Bill, I can see that there's people watching this who are getting individually set free and recognizing what's happening, but how do you deal with this on a national level when the media is in the pocket of all of the liberals and, and uh, projecting their, their uh, crimes. <laughs> crimes and their propaganda. How, how do you deal with this on a national level? Well, the first thing is you sign up for truth and liberty. <laughs> right? And, and you, you support those that are putting out the truth. Um, 
it's a, it's a battle. It's a battle for the mind. Uh, the, you know, the Bible says, you know, cast down every thought, uh, take them captive, renew your mind, think on things. So, so the battle is, is over your thoughts. But because of this group think, you have like in, for instance, in the House, the majority are liberals. In the Senate, it's split. And then you got the White House and then you got all the media and you got all this stuff. I would say that the majority are pro projecting all of these lies. How do you overcome that when the majority are doing this? Yeah, it's, um, uh, it's, it's tough. It's a battle. And, and I can't help but think that the Lord is letting it happen so that each and every one of us are put in a position of having to choose. And the choice is, are we going to repent and serve Jesus and love him no matter what anybody else says about us? Or are we going to cave and say, okay, I'll, I'll give up my, my conscience and belief and I'll just to fit in with the group. Mm -hmm. So to go back to one of your analogies, if you see that this line is shorter than this one over here, it doesn't matter what everybody else is saying. You got to st step up and speak the truth. And of course, the word of God is the standard. Okay. You know, the, in that um, Solomon Ash conformity experiment that you referenced, uh, they found out that if just one of the other people objected it went from 30% down to 5%. Mm, so in other words, wow. if you have the courage to call out the, the truth, you're going to encourage a lot of other people to stand up uh, against it too. And um, I was listening to Bob McEwen today. He's in our biblical worldview. And he was saying, you know, if you say that this room is 20 feet wide, I say it's 18. Another person says it's 22. Those are opinions and nobody yeah. Uh, can guarantee anything. But if you come along with a tape measure and measure it, then that has exposed the error. Right. And so people hate that and they will try and come against the truth. And that's what mm. we see. They're thought police. You can't even uh, have your own individual thoughts. You have to adopt their line and stuff. But the answer is just the truth. Mm. If we would speak the truth, the truth will expose the lies. Yeah. You know, I, uh, we need to pray for the military because there's a, a purging going on. And um, since I like to see stories in history that can sort of apply, uh, for the first three centuries of Christianity, there are 10 major persecutions. I have to remind myself, the church was born into a one world anti-Christian government, the Roman Empire. I mean, if, if you and I were to start something, we'd be like, you know, protect it for a little while, like a greenhouse, let it grow a little bit before you let it get smashed. No, immediately God let the church be persecuted. And the, uh, the, the Christians prayed for boldness. They didn't run and hide. But the first three centuries, the Christian experience was meeting in catacombs. Went to school in Rome and college, all right, for six months, and we toured the catacombs. You'd, you know, crawl almost, you know, down a little passageway and get into a little room that, that was carved out of the rock, and they would, you know, have candle marks in first century Christian graffiti. That was a Christian experience. And um, anyway, uh, so then you have an, uh, but Christianity still grows. And then you have an emperor named uh, Galenius, and he's a little tolerant, 260 AD. And the, he doesn't really enforce all the pagan. And so Christianity grows. And there's a lot of Christians now in the military. They love Rome. They're supporting the emperor. And they're, they're serving. But then you have Diocletian becomes the emperor in 285 AD. He loses some battles with Persia. He asked his generals why. And the general said, well, you've, it's your fault because you've allowed the army to neglect to worship the Roman gods. And Diocletian says, OK, army. Get back to worshiping the Roman gods. Well, there's a lot of Christians in the military, and, and they can't do that. And so the Christians are purged from the military. Mm. Once all the Christians are out of the military, Diocletian decides to use the military to force the entire Roman Empire to return to worshiping the Roman gods. And they go systematically, province by province, arresting pastors, burning down churches, taking the, burning the scriptures, cutting out their tongues, boiling them alive. It goes on for 10 years. So, so uh, there is a serious threat when the military gets purged. It's naive of us to think that the people pushing this agenda will push their agenda through the schools. They'll push it through the courts. They'll push it through Lois Lerner having the IRS target conservative organizations. They'll push it through, uh, you know, here's Eric Holder giving guns to drug gangs in Mexico with Fast and Furious. Uh, they'll push their agenda with um, co-opting the intelligence agencies to dig up dirt on their political opponents. It's naive of us to think 
that they, once they purge the, the military of Christians, they will, that they won't be tempted to want to use that to push their agenda. Yeah. Mm. And that's what we're seeing around the world, you know, in China going into Hong Kong and, you know, remember the freedom demonstrators in Cuba and then it got really silent because we didn't do anything. Yeah, those, we need to pray for those people because they're get, been rounded up and locked away. There's some Christians who, who would they listen to that and they say, oh, well then why should we fight? Why should we oppose this? Because it's all going to turn out for good. God wants us to be persecuted. Do you, do you think that's right thinking or not? Yeah, so my response to that is, uh, God is looking at you to see how you will respond. And so he got to do what was in Abraham's heart, but he wanted to see Abraham be willing to take his son Isaac to the top of Mount Moriah and be willing to kill him. People said, you know, God knows my heart. He goes, yeah, he does. Ma imagine a guy watching football on the couch and you come to him and you say, hey, when was the last time you told your wife you love her? Uh, I can't remember, but she knows my heart. Like, okay. Uh, when was the last time you did anything to show your wife you love her? Uh, I can't remember, but she knows my heart. It's like, dude, we need to have a little talk here, <laughs> right? People say, well, God knows my heart. Yes, he does know your heart. And he wants to see some actions. He wants to hear some words out of your mouth. And the crisis of the era is the opportunity for you to respond. And so every generation is at a crisis. Uh, bubonic plague, Attila the Hun, Genghis Khan, Spanish flu. I mean, every generation, and all of them have been serious. Yes, they are increasing and they're beginning to take more of a global dimension they've never been before. But you know what? If we get through this crisis, there'll be another one. That's we get through true. that crisis, there'll be another That's one. That's true. And so it's almost like God knew that there's going to be crisis, but the crisis of the era is the opportunity for the people that are alive in that era to respond. Historically, the Christians would run to the bubonic plague and minister to people and give them, you know, William Penn, he noticed the Quakers in 1665, there's this plague in London and, um, and the Quakers were like taking, helping to take care of the people that were sick and dying. They even got accused by the media of spreading the disease. And, it, and, William, Penn, there. <laughs> and, and William Penn was like, um, no, these Quakers are innocent, but here they are. And, uh, but he saw these religious people making fun, and that, Im that impacted William Penn so that he eventually converted and became. But Christians historically would run to the crises. And, um, mm. and so here we are today, there's crises, and God is watching to see how we respond. And are we going to love the unlovable? Or are we going to rescue those who are unjustly sentenced to death? Or are we going to defend the defenseless? Or are we going to stand up for the innocent? And, the, and you know, are we going to preach the gospel? Or, or are we going to run and hide? Are we going to ultimately deny our faith? Are we going to deny Jesus like, like Peter, right? Or, so so the, the crisis is, is God giving you an opportunity to reveal whose side you're on. Mm -hmm. So instead of sitting back and saying, well, whatever's going to happen, happens. No, no, what, what's happening is God wanting to see how you're going to respond to it. Yeah, yeah. that's good. Yeah. We need to take some questions. I bet you we got a few. We've got a few. Here's one. I, I know you can answer this one, Andrew. It's, uh, is Jesus going to return before the year 2030? <laughs> you asked me that? <laughs> well, we Nobody were talking knows. about this. We were talking about this. Before Nobody this knows, but you know what? God's given me a vision that goes as far as I can see in the future. So either he's wanting me to occupy till he comes or mm -hmm. no, he's not going to come back by 2030. I don't know, but I'm going to act like, well, we I'm going to work like he's coming back never, but I'm ready if he's coming back today. Well, we were talking before the show about how it, you don't believe that it's a time certain on God's mm -hmm. calendar and that what we do can determine uh, yep. whether Satan takes over or not. I don't believe God's got a date circled in heaven. I believe it's, he just knows Human nature, he knows the devil, he knows where things are going, but if the people of God will stand up, we can prevent it from happening right now. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of examples in the Bible of, of God changing. He prophesied something, but it changed or didn't yep. come to pass because yep. of humans, uh, our, our response to that. Yeah, people ask, ask me, say, you know, what do you, think's, what do you think God's going to do? And I respond, well, maybe God's watching us to see, and, and then he's going to decide. See if we doing. repent, he might put it off. Uh, if we don't repent, he might let it hit the fan. And the biblical analogy is uh, Manasseh, wicked king of Judah, sacrificing children to Moloch. The prophets come to him and says, you're filling the streets of Jerusalem with the blood of these innocent kids. And, and, and the prophets say, you're doing the same wicked thing that the people that were here before Israel came in did. 
because they were doing it, God brought Israel in to drive them out. Because you're doing it, I'm going to drive you out. I mean, there's nothing more unjust than killing an innocent baby who's never done anything wrong. Mm -hmm. And God is a just God. And in, if God does not judge that, his silence is giving consent to that. And if God gives consent to that, he's no longer a just God. So in law, it's, in common law, it's called the, the rule of tacit admission. And it's in wedding ceremonies. You know, if a pastor says, anybody that's against this wedding, speak now or forever hold your peace. If you're sitting there at the wedding silent, your silence is giving consent to the wedding. Silence equals consent. And so if there are unjust things like babies being killed who have not done anything wrong, if a, a just God is silent and not judging that, the most unjust of acts, he's no longer a just God. He denies his just nature. He denies himself. He ungods himself. He's cast out of heaven. He, he's no longer a just God. And guess what? He is not going to deny himself. He is going to judge every sin. And that's why we trust in the Lamb, Jesus Christ, because he was the Lamb that, that took the judgment for our sin. So Jesus didn't get rid of the law. He just paid the penalty for us breaking the law. But the idea is that uh, God sent these prophets to Manasseh and says, you're filling the streets of Jerusalem with the blood of these innocent children, and judgment's going to come. Well, Manasseh has a grandson named Josiah. He's eight years old when he becomes the king, 16 years old, starts to seek the Lord. He's a teenager. Early 20s, he tells him to clean out the temple that his granddad had trashed, and the priests come out with the scroll. Josephus said it was the last copy because Manasseh was evidently destroying the Bible and the scrolls. The last one, it was the original one that Moses had wrapped in burlap, buried in some storage room. The priests read it, and they go, whoa, this, we've never read it before because it's so unusual. And then they read it to this young Josiah. He rips his garments and repents. And then here, Josiah, Jeremiah is out of town at this time. So Jeremiah sends messengers to a woman named Huldah. She's the wife of the king's tailor. But this woman has a reputation from hearing from God. And the messengers say, well, the king wants to know what's going to happen. And she says, tell the man that sent you that judgment will come because of Israel's sins, but not during his lifetime because he repented when he heard the words of the Lord. Mm. And so Josiah goes out and tears down the Sodomite temples. He uh, has the Levites teaching the law, has a revival, has this huge Passover. Supposedly, it was that revival that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego got saved, if you could use that term. But this uh, was such a big uh, it's a 31 year reprieve from the judgment because the people repented. Mm. Now, when Josiah died, it went down the tubes really fast with Zedekiah. But I'm praying for a Josiah generation. I'm praying to if we repent and, and all liberty is individual, all repentance is individual. It's not somebody out there repenting. It's you re repenting. It's me repenting. It's going into your closet and praying. Right. And going back to the, your first love, worshiping the Lord, singing praise songs to him. Right. And, and, and when we repent individually, uh, then and if enough of us do, right. It, it, Second Chronicles 714, if, if my people that, you know, call by my name shall humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, I'll hear from heaven, heal their, and forgive their sins, heal their land. Mm. And another question. Yes, sir. So, um, has there, uh, well, let's see here. How many times in U.S. history have the current strategies been attempted and then overcome? This is from Anna on chat. Have we overcome this kind of attack, the this kind of strategies like you were before? Discussing. Yeah. Psychological projection and all of this. Yeah. Uh, it's been used before, but never to the scale. Um, you know, one of the things I've studied is um, history and repeating uh, themes. And in uh, geometry, it's called the golden ratio or phi PHI or the Fibonacci sequence. It's a, it's a rate of expansion that you see in a seashell. It does a little circle, comes around a little bigger circle, comes around a little bigger, bigger circle. You observe it in a tornado, a hurricane, a galaxy. And it's, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, investors will use it to plot uh, a return on an investment. If it grows at a certain rate, they well, it might be the same rate. And they'll project it. And so I thought I'd study all the kingdoms of world history. Nimrods, Pharaoh, Caesar, Kaiser, Sultan, Tsar. And you, sure enough, you see it's the same fall in nature of Cain, Kill, and Abel, but there's a, always a new military advancement that the king can kill more people. So instead of killing with a rock, you kill with a bronze weapon or an iron weapon or a phalanx spear or a scimitar sword or gunpowder. The weapon improves, but it's that same selfish nature. But it clearly 
if, if, any, if any of these dictators hadn't have died, any one of them would have been glad to have the whole world under their thumb. And so in, in that sense, death is a blessing because the devil has to start from scratch again. Mm -hmm. All these kingdoms are ruled through fear. And um, so, uh, so this is the idea of um, uh, what has anything happened again? So you see these themes happening and you see them coming on a bigger and bigger scale. But Jesus says the wheat and tares grow together till the harvest. So it's almost like the spiritual descendants of Cain are always trying to kill the spiritual descendants of Abel. That's right. Abel trusted in the lamb. We're trusting in the lamb. Right. In the Old Testament, they trusted in the lamb to come and we trust in the lamb that came. But salvation is through the lamb because God's a just God. He has to judge every sin, but he's a loving God. And he provided the lamb to take the judgment for the sin. So we approach God through the lamb. So uh, so, yes, we've seen these themes in America before, but we're seeing it on a level never before seen. And we're seeing it globally on a level before. And now with 5G satellites there, you know, why I'm living in Florida. And one time I came out and I saw a whole string of stars that I'd never seen before. I'm like, what? What is that? And so I do a quick Google search and it's Starnet or Starlink. And it's, you know, Elon Musk is putting that up. I saw those too. I yeah. saw that sitting in my spa and I counted them. There was 40 of them that were in a line and they were evenly spaced and moving across the sky. And I went and looked it up and it was those satellites. Mm -hmm. So they, they're putting a whole net of them so the, there will not be any place on planet Earth that you can go and hide. I saw one well, this morning. Oh, did you? And it was, I thought it was a plane because it went from the east, going southeast, and it went right up into the, and it stopped. I've never seen that before. Wow. I have no idea what that was, but it stopped. And I watched it for 20 or 30 minutes and it never moved. Mm. I don't know what that was. Sometimes it's drones. They you know, drones sometimes you'll see these days and they look like aircraft. But, you know, going back to that point, Bill, I, the, the word says, I think, uh, in Psalms that if Psalms 11, if the foundations be destroyed, what will the righteous do? And I think that's an old covenant question that doesn't have an answer until the new covenant. And the Bible says that the weapons of our warfare are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. If the church responds to this, this global cabal or whatever, if we stand up and proclaim the truth and stand for righteousness, don't you think we can turn this thing around? Yeah, I mean, what are the stories we love best in the Bible? It's where God's people are in hopeless situations and he raises up little Amen. nobodies. Amen. You know, an 80 year old Moses, a teenager, David, you know, a scared guy named Gideon, a woman, Deborah. In other words, God likes to wait until things look hopeless. And then he raises up little nobodies who are small in their own eyes, humble, but big in faith and courage to do great things. And it's almost you read the Gideon story, 100,000 Midianites. He gets 30,000 Israelites. And God says, tell everyone that's scared to go home. Great. Now he's gone to only 10,000. God said, it's still too many. Go drink from a creek. In other words, God wanted to make the odds really bad. And then God rolls up his sleeves and says, now, now watch this. Yeah. Right. And so it, this is our, the time we're living in. And in a sense, you wouldn't have it any other way. I mean, imagine if you lived at a time when everything was done, all the diseases were cured, all the babies were fed, everybody knew the Lord, and you get to heaven and you're there with Moses and Gideon and David, and, and, and they're all telling their exciting stories. And then they say, tell us your story. And you go, eh, it was all done by the time I came around. And they're going to say, boring. So for the rest of eternity, you'll be known as the boring story guy. Right? No, we get to say, no, man, let me tell you about what they're doing. You know, I mean, they're, they're cutting babies up and selling their body parts and they're teaching little kids all kinds of perversion. I said enough. I can't I can't take it anymore. God, use me. And people are going to say bad things about you. They're going to post bad things about you online. Right. People say, well, you know, you run for office. I was in, um, I guess, in somewhere in Missouri last week and uh, there was a lady that got elected to the school board and she um, said that the local newspaper it just rips her up all the time. And her husband was there was like, yeah, man, they just they just loved. And um, I says, that is the price you pay when you want to let the Lord use you. Jesus in Philippians, it says, let, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ who made himself of no reputation. I mean, here he is basically hanging naked on a cross, the son of God, but he did it so that he could purchase you, purchase your, your salvation. He made himself with no reputation. And we're, we're following him. The, the price you pay is to say, I'm, people are going to say bad things about you. But all you care about is what, what Jesus says about you. Mm -hmm. That's awesome.
I tell you what, we need to be like the first responders running to the problem oh, that's good. to deal with it instead of running away from it. And so many so people good. have that self-preservation. They're just going to take the path of least resistance. Amen. Yeah, I mean, what's, into what's the goal in life? To tiptoe from one side to the other without stepping on a landmine? <laughs> So if, I, if I can just get through this life and, and die and, and not have anybody sue me or not have anything go by, it's like, no, you want to be the, the Lord's champion and let him use you. Mm -hmm. So there are some students uh, in school and they didn't like, um, you know, all these different mandates and so forth. And they stood up and, and they sued and they won. And there's a bunch of moms in Iowa called the Mama Bears. They had never been involved in politics before, but they saw these kids with their snotty masks they had to wear and get, rub them in the playground dirt, and they had to put them back on again. And they said, this isn't helping anything. Besides, they got such a low rate of, you know. And so they actually pushed it through and got a law passed in Iowa. I mean, but these are individual people that are saying, look, we're, we're going to stand up. And... Um, but, you know, our society has become increasingly secular and sad to say most Christians are more influenced by the world than they are influenced in the world. And so the non-believers just have this self-preservation. They don't think about eternity. This is all there is to them. And self-preservation dominates most people. And in the past, uh, like you were saying, during the plagues, the Christians would run to the things and put their life on the line because they knew that if they died, they were going to go be with the Lord. Uh, a scripture that backs that up is Hebrews 2.15, that all their lifetime they were subject to bondage through a fear of death. And sad to say, many Christians have a fear of death. They don't know the fullness of what we've got. And so because of it, they're just taking the easiest path, self-preservation, trying to avoid all problems, and that's not a godly Christian attitude at all. You know, I, I know we're out of time, but just real quick, um, you mentioned eternity. Um, you know the critical race video they do with all the kids standing on a starting line, and they tell the kids, if you're from a home with two parents, you've got a special advantage, take a step forward. And if you're from a safe neighborhood, take a step forward. And if you've got a cell phone. And so pretty soon some kids are way in front, and then the camera looks at the kids on the starting line, and they've got, this isn't fair. And it's pretty convincing until you ask yourself, what's the finish line? Is the finish line how much stuff you can accumulate before you die and leave it all behind? Amen. Or is the finish line standing before God? That's really good. And him saying, I gave you a bunch of stuff, but what did you do with it? I was naked. Did you clothe me? I was in prison did, and, and sick. Did you visit me? Mm -hmm. Right? I was, you know, uh, hungry. Did you feed me? And so the, it's not how much you get. It's what you do with what you get. You know, I hate to cut you off, Bill, but uh, you need to give your web address again. Tell people how they can participate. We're just about out of time. Well, thanks. It's, it's AmericanMinute.com. Uh, the book I've been mentioning is Socialism, the Real History from Plato to the Present. And then we have it as a flash drive with a dozen presentations that I've given around the country and um, that you can um, uh, get. So AmericanMinute.com. So we're out of time tonight, but let me just remind you again that we do this every Monday night at 6 p.m. Uh, Colorado time. I also want to thank CTN for carrying our program and uh, doing that just free for us. What a blessing that is. And we have on some great guests, just like Bill Federer. And uh, so anyway, it's just a great thing. I really encourage you to share this with somebody else. And also remember that we're looking for people to become partners because we are branching out. We're now beginning to spend quite a bit of money mm -hmm. to make a difference in the political realm, not just comment on it. And we need people to stand with us. Go to our website. You can become a monthly partner for an automatic withdrawal. It'll be a blessing to you. Thank you for joining us. See you again next week. Join us next time for the Truth and Liberty broadcast. Find tonight's episode and related articles and links at truthandliberty.net. Truth and Liberty is viewer supported. If you'd like to help us continue our live casts, you can make a donation at truthandliberty.net.